So this morning, uh, we're working on the build-up to Easter. And one of my obsessions, I guess you'd call it, is I love to study personalities of the Bible. I like to, I love to study their, how they interacted with Jesus, how God worked in their lives. I, I love the, the study of the people that were chosen to be put in the Bible. And today, to me, one of the more fascinating guys. I love this. And uh, your handout, I, it's just talking about Thomas. Most people know him as Doubting Thomas. And, um, you know, I'm talking about a pet peeve here for a minute, okay? I think there is danger when we judge a person by one mistake. Or we judge a person by one act. We judge, and uh, <laughs> because that one decision that they made, we often use that to define who they are the rest of their life. And like with Thomas, this one moment was a defining moment, but it was also a transitional moment. It was part of his spiritual growth. And so as we read this, when I say the word Thomas, 99% of the world is familiar with the Word of God, will say Doubting Thomas. Because in that moment, he, that was the attribute that he was most showing. And so in my mind, I was going through the people in the Bible that we have talked about as a church. We talk a lot about David and Bathsheba here lately. And it's easy to put David in that, uh, that niche to where he had committed adultery and committed murder and done things. And then you talk about Jacob. Well, he, uh, being the con man he was, ended up stealing his brother's birthright. Um, if I say the word Abraham, often we'll say the word Hagar. And, you know, then Ishmael, we start talking about the, the long-term ramification of Abraham's decision. If I say Samson, then you're obviously going to say haircut. Uh, I mean, you're going to say Delilah, yeah? And uh, so as we go through this, we begin to associate one act, one decision. Take Samson, for instance. Samson disobeyed God, rebelled against God, but what we miss is Samson ruled Israel for 40 years prior to. Samson was a ruler, a, a judge in Israel, and uh, he had faithfully served for a lot of years. <coughs> so here, in this passage of Scripture, I wrote it out on your handout, this because I felt this was uh, an incredibly powerful thing, and I'm just going to move through it with you and uh, glean some truths that hopefully... So anyway, verse 24 on your handout there. John chapter 20, verse 24. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. And he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my finger in them, and place my hand into the wounds in his side. And eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. And the doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be to you, he said. Then he looked at Thomas. Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your finger in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. <coughs> the layers of truths that I see in this. Basically, all I want to do this morning is kind of do a expository look at this passage of Scripture. Um, the first one, verse 24. Because here the twelve disciples, one of the twelve disciples was not with the other guys. And so in my mind, I love to use my imagination, put myself in Scripture. I love to try and imagine what was going on in that moment and what they were experiencing. And here, Jesus had died. Jesus had been killed. They had put their hopes, their dreams. They had followed Him. They had made the sacrifices. They had committed their lives. And their expectations of what they'd anticipated had come to naught at this point. And they were they had to be just heartbroken. And so Jesus, <coughs> he had died. And so in my mind, Thomas had loved Jesus so much. I had, uh, when, I, when I worked through this, one of the things I found was that uh, in John chapter 11, just a few chapters before, Jesus, he was wanting to go to Jerusalem. And uh, he was going to go to Jerusalem, and he was going to heal Lazarus. He had some things he was going to be doing. 
and he was going to be killed. There was no doubt that the, the crowds were against him, the religious leaders were against him, and he was going to be killed. And so what did Thomas say? In John, John chapter 11, around verse 13, he said, well, I guess if you're going to go get killed, we're going to go with you, and we're going to get killed too. Thomas loved Jesus so much that he was willing to walk into the face of death. He was willing to face danger with Jesus. He was, a, he was committed. He loved him. And so when Jesus was killed, one of the things that I'm very familiar with is in grief, people often withdraw, don't they? In grief, when someone is suffering in grief, and they, they, one of the things they often need to do is just spend some time alone, processing, um, weeping, I mean, going through maybe anger and going through all the different things that we feel. Maybe that's what was happening to Thomas here. Maybe Thomas had withdrawn and his love for Christ was so much that his grief was so great that he needed some time alone to process. And what happens? He missed out seeing Jesus. Jesus appeared to all the rest of them and Thomas was, well, he wasn't there. He missed out. And uh, I've heard a lot of sermons preached on this where they say, you know, this is what happens when you miss out on church. <laughs> this is what happens when you miss out, you know, you miss out being close to God. Well, in Thomas's case, this was true. So then verse 25, so they told him, we have seen the Lord. So here he has some credible eyewitnesses, didn't he? Thomas had credible eyewitnesses that had seen the Lord. And what does he say? Nope. Unless I see it for myself and I become an eyewitness, I'm not going to buy into this whole thing. <coughs> Thomas was struggling with faith issues. One of the things that I love to learn things from Scripture that I can apply to my life. I love to learn things from Scripture that I can put to work in my life. And one of the things here is I recognize that Thomas at this point was struggling with faith. He was struggling with uh, who God was. He was struggling because before, oh man, we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, often the extent that God will use you has to do with the level that you will be broken. The struggle, the spiritual struggle, the storm of life that you have to face, maybe even the desperation and the heartache that you experience, God brings you through that, and as you come through that storm and you come through that heartache, then God will reach out and will do a work in your heart. And if when you're in the midst of that, you won't see this. But you remember the parable of the sower? You remember the parable that said, you know, sometimes there's rocky ground, and sometimes there's thorny ground, and sometimes... There's... And Jesus was describing the different kinds of soil, and when you plant seeds in it, what will happen to those seeds? Well, sometimes... That soil needs to be broken up. Sometimes the soil of my heart, the soil in my heart is maybe full of weeds, maybe it's full of thistles, maybe my heart is full of, it's just grown hard, and it is cold, and God will allow something into my life that will break up that soil, will go in there and, and frankly do a miracle in my heart and bring me to a place where I have to look at Him. I have to trust Him again. And I think that's what's happened to Thomas right here in verse 25. He said, listen, I can't believe. He is struggling. He's having a crisis of faith. And uh, often there's numerous books out called The Dark Night of the Soul. The Dark Night of the Soul. And uh, pretty much every great spiritual leader has <laughs> at some point experienced a dark night of the soul where things, it's like the wheels had come off the things that they had put their confidence in, the things they put their, their faith into, was challenged. Here, Thomas had found what he believed Jesus to be was being challenged. Jesus has died, and now Thomas is like, now you're telling me he's alive, and I don't know if I'm going to believe it. I need some physical evidence. Now, by the way, I find this wonderful because this is a transitional stage. My dad might talk about this, how throughout the Bible, it seems like there are transitional times. The, book, the whole book of Acts is a book of transition to where Jesus is walking the earth and Jesus is talking to people and then this is kind of the, the direction that uh, Christianity is moving. And then the book of Acts hits and all of a sudden the church is introduced. We hit the book of Acts and there's so many changes in the book of Acts. A time of transition. 
I believe that this little short blurb right here in John chapter 20 is one of the points of transitions. Why? Because up until then, Thomas had sat across the table, ate, ate bread, and listened to Jesus talk. Right? He had been there, Jesus breaking bread and the loaves and the fishes and giving it to the people. He's watching as Jesus raises Lazarus. He, how much faith does that require? Yeah, G, all of a sudden he goes from seeing Jesus performing miracles, being able to physically ask him questions, to all of a sudden what? Now, all of a sudden there's this transition. Now he's got to act by faith. Ooh, that ain't near as much fun. Walking by faith. What does that entail? And by the way, the thing to remember about faith is there are different levels of faith. I mean, almost a day-to-day -day challenge. I have a sermon series I haven't preached in many years. Uh, I, I, I call it the six steps of faith. Six levels of faith. And um, every believer has different places. And here's, I want you to understand how precious this is. I think this is one of the most precious stories in the whole Bible because it reveals the heart of Jesus. So I'm just going to move through this rather quickly, I think. Because the next verse, 26, says, eight days later. And by the way, this is so hard for you and I. Because here we've got verse 25, where they said, we have seen the Lord. What? Seeds have been planted in Thomas's heart that Jesus is alive. And he, all of a sudden, he says, I don't buy it for a minute. If this is true, then I want to see, I want to touch, I want to experience. And then verse 26, why did it take eight days? Eight days. I, I was praying about this. Listen, God is not in a hurry to do transitional work in our hearts. He isn't in a hurry. God is not restricted by a Timex. Nope. God is more God is more serious and more focused on your heart becoming more like his son's heart, your thoughts becoming more like his son's heart than it is a schedule where say, well, we have to have this done by Monday. No, God knew that it was going to take Thomas eight days to for his heart to soften, for his eyes to open, to where Thomas would come to a place to where he was willing to listen and be open to who Jesus is. This is incredibly powerful. I think that, here's, here's the point. I love the fact that God will meet you where you are, when you are, give you exactly what you need in that moment. I love that. Because all of a sudden, He doesn't have to come on an agenda or a timetable or meet with, you know, you have to clean up your life. One of the most, one of the most common things people tell me is, well, I'm going to come out to your church. But first. And then they start talking about how they're going to basically, you know, clean up their life and, you know, and probably take a shower or something. I don't know. And, uh, you know, they, they want to do this before they come in the doors. Why? Because they don't want God to see them as they are. And this passage, this is God telling Thomas, saying, hey, listen, I know who you are, and I'm going to give you the time for my words to sink into your heart. Why, why, why is that important? Because Jesus had been teaching his disciples all along that he was going to die. He was teaching them all along that he was going to die, but he wasn't going to stay dead. He was going to come out of the grave. He's going to be victorious. We call that Easter. And so all this was going to happen, and it was going to be exciting. And it just took Thomas some time to process this. Now, there are people I know that uh, they just seem to come by faith very naturally. They only may have needed two days. And I know other people that may have needed two years. Thomas himself needed eight days. That was a, the amount of time that God knew Thomas's heart was going to require to be softened before he experienced Jesus. So eight days later, the disciples come together again. All right. So they come together. Thomas is with them. And the doors are locked. So why are the doors locked? I love these stories. The doors are locked because if you're a believer, they're going to kill you. Well, they just killed their master. Yeah, they just killed Jesus, and now they're head hunting. I mean, that was a booming success. And so now they're out hunting. And so the disciples are together, and they're, they're, they lock the doors because... And by the way, I find this fascinating. So the, the disciples are hiding. So who went to the tomb? 
the gals. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't need a lot of explaining. Uh, they were, they had work to do. They had things they wanted to accomplish. The gals went to this tomb while the guys were locked in a room thinking, man, we don't want to die. So here we've got, <clears throat> the doors are locked, and this next part I can't explain to you because the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about this. It says suddenly Jesus was standing before them. Suddenly and before, Jesus is just there, moving through walls, moving through locked doors in a glorified body. This is after he had died, after he rose again, he's in a glorified state. What that means, I don't know. you got to ask Calvin. I'm sure he'll explain it to me. <laughs> Sorry, Calvin. <laughs> no, this is one of those things the Bible isn't clear about. And uh, the, I, I don't know. Whatever it is, it is miraculous. I always think maybe that's why I got, the Bible doesn't describe heaven in great detail. Because I'm just not sure we can handle it. I think we'd be in such a hurry to get there that... It would distort what he needs us to do here and now. We, our eyes would be elsewhere. And so here, Jesus is among them. And if somebody walked through a locked door, walked up, put an arm around your shoulder and says, Hey, Randy, how you doing? You would freak out. <laughs> I mean, you come moving through a locked door, moving through... And so what? What is the first word? And I, don't you love this about Jesus? Jesus understands the fear that's going to strike their hearts. First words out of his mouth is, hey, relax, guys. Take it easy. Relax. Peace be unto you. I love that. Jesus offers what people need the most when they need it the most. By the way, I in the in my in my years of ministry, I have uh, found that this is incredibly insightful. Um, this week I uh, I had two people that I work with. Um, it's funny because they're getting more comfortable with me. And uh, when they sneeze, I bless them. And <laughs> that cracks them up. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so they're getting to the point where they're starting to uh, bait me. And they're, they're wanting to challenge. And so they'll watch something on the Discover channel that, you know, kind of, they know I'm not going to buy into. And, and so they'll whoop it on me, you know. They can't wait for Monday mornings to whoop it on me. And so uh, I'll go to work, and they'll be like, well, what about? And, you know, and we, I notice it changes from the Discovery Channel to we think. Or, and so uh, the first question I always have is, does it matter? You know, in my mind, I'm like, God, is this something that, is this a football that you want me to, you know, catch? Or is this one that you should, I should just let fly by and wait for the next one? And uh, I have found that being patient pays off. And so that usually, and uh, by the way, pastoral counseling, the same thing applies. The first pitch people throw is usually not where their heart is. It's something they feel very comfortable with. And then if you don't really bite on that one, they'll throw something else that's a little more serious. And if you kind of let that one go by and you, you let them kind of, and but pretty soon you'll kind of get to the heart of the matter. And uh, once they finally waded through the little argumentative things that they were going to use to distract me, they get down to, all right, basically, is God good? It usually comes down to, is God really good? Now, I like that one. That one's got some meat on it. I mean, we can, all right, because uh, I recognize the fact that it is important at this point to establish what their authority is on what they believe. This is huge. All right, this is a monster. If they're, if they view the Discovery Channel as their authority for what they believe, well, wait an hour and you're going to have a different show on, and it's going to take you in a different direction. All right, so that's you know that's building your belief system on on the sand. All right, that's not going to carry. When the storms of life hit, it's going to fall. And so, they, they, both of them, apparently they'd been talking before I got there. Because uh, when it, when it come out that they were, um, they, they, they were trying to convince me that you didn't need to go to church and you didn't need a pastor and that truth is in everybody's heart and you need to look into your own self for truth. And so as they're pursuing this avenue of thought, I said, so, I said, so who do you call when you need a funeral? 
They what? <laughs> so, so when some when somebody you love or you is told by a doctor that you have cancer, who do you call? Are you going to call me? Or are you going to call the producer of the Discovery Channel and you know ask him to come you know show you some reels? And you know, I'm not actually being sarcastic. It's all I'm doing is by the way. What did Jesus do when he was interacting with people? He asked questions. He would ask them questions that would drive to the heart of the matter. And so, when I ask him, say, so when you need a funeral for somebody that you love, somebody that's very close to you, who are you going to call? And all of a sudden, they're forced to take all their assumptions that they have been putting out there and say, well, maybe there is a purpose for a pastor. Maybe there is a purpose for a person of God that speaks the Word of God. Now, I've opened that door. So now what do I do with it? Now I'm like, I want to leave it open-ended. I don't want to give them a, a closed-ended question. I want to give it open-ended to where, so, okay, so you want me for a funeral, right? You want me to come in and conduct a funeral. You, you want me to be your messenger of peace and comfort between God and God in the Greek family, right? You want me to be the messenger, right? So, so where does that stop? So what about? And so now I can start asking questions about the what about. So are, does that extend to this circumstance? Does that extend to this? And, and all of a sudden, I, said, I told him, I said, listen, God wants to be involved in your life in every moment of every day. He's already there. He's acutely aware of what's going on in your life. The question is, how long will it take for you to open your heart and open your mind just to listen to what he has to say? Just to listen. That's what's, I think that's what's happening in these eight days. In these eight days, by the way, these eight days, they're not put in a freezer and some suspended animation just to wait. No. For eight days, God is banging on Thomas's heart. For eight days, circum uh, can't talk. Events, circumstances, and people. God is bringing these into Thomas's life, preparing him for the time in verse 27 where he shows up. He is leading Thomas to a point to where he is prepared to see Jesus, prepared to meet Jesus. This is also why I find it interesting. Um, they've done studies, and it's, it's repeatedly found. That when somebody trusts Christ as Savior, when someone comes to Christ, it's usually not a one-time thing. Usually, Larry will talk to him, and Randy will talk to him. You know, and they'll have at least eight contacts with people. Sometimes years and years of contacts before something will happen in their life, and they're like, I know the answer to this one. We had a guy that used to come to jail all the time, and... Uh, we, he was what we called a frequent flyer downstairs. And uh, when it started getting cold outside, he would mysteriously have a burglary. And um, we ended up going back to jail for the winter because he wanted some dental work done and he needed his meds refilled. And, you know. and so he'd come down to the jail and uh, he would, I promise, this is a true story. He'd walk in the jail and he'd look at me, give me a hug, and he'd say, you got my Bible? And I'd give him his Bible. And, and uh, he, he, he would basically... I'll tell you the whole story because it's a good one. I got time. Since you didn't know the first song, I cut verses out, so God bought me more time. Um, I had my jail was too full, so I sent him to Geiger. Geiger, Spokane County, was housing our overflow for a quarter of a million dollars. You'd be surprised how many people they would house for us. And so uh, we'd send him down to Geiger. And so one night on Channel Two, this guy was on TV. <laughs> the inmates, I hear them down there yelling. So I go down there because when people are yelling in jail, it's usually not good. So I go down there and what's up? And they're pointing at the TV and there's Chad on TV. And he is leading Bible studies in Geiger. And he is the man of the hour. He's the man of God representing uh, to, to the troops housed in Geiger. And uh, I'll never forget him. I think he's passed away since then. But uh, yeah, he. Uh, my point is this. There were some naysayers, and I told him, I said, listen, every time he goes to jail, he opens his Bible, he opens his heart, and God has spent the last 10 years banging on his heart because the soil of his heart 
is not described in by one of Jesus' parables because the soil of his heart was stupid. A whole new sermon series. I should write a book. The stupidness of hearts. And his heart was stupid. And because when he'd walk out of the jail, he'd run back with his old friends, he'd run back with, and he'd get back into the same foolishness that he was in before, and then it'd get cold outside and he'd commit his crime and go back to jail, and then he'd become super Christian again. And um, I worked hard to hold him accountable for what the Bible said. And since I knew his, his heart, I tried to keep it very simple with the promises of God work. And so I would give him like one verse. Every time he come to jail, I'd give him one verse. And he and I would pray together often. Often, right? I'd swing by at night. I'd, before I'd go home, I'd swing by and he'd want to pray. We'd have a word of prayer in his cell. And um, I believe that God, where it took Thomas eight days, I think it took Chad a lifetime. It took him a lifetime. And eventually he went blind. He had a disease, took his eyes. And, and um, he... It took him years and years and years of the Spirit of God working in his heart, trying to bring him to a place of honesty and humility to where he would see God for who he is. That's cool. That is exactly what happened in verse 28. My Lord and my God. What is he doing? He is acknowledging that Jesus is God. He's acknowledging that Jesus is the Almighty, that Jesus is the keeper of promises, that Jesus is a holder of life and death. He's a creator. You can keep going here. All of a sudden, it's like the light shone through. I heard an old pastor one time say, the reason God breaks our hearts is to allow the light to shine in. I like that. I like the, the mental, the visual picture of that. Because here, Thomas's heart was breaking. He had lost his master. He had lost Jesus in death. And so now he has got eight days to where the rumors are flying. Can you imagine all the rumors flying around Jerusalem? Well, somebody stole the body. Somebody, you know. <laughs> Great robbing was so common. I think I put it on your hand up. I, I tried to. My problem was I didn't have much room and I had a whole lot of things to talk about. I ended up taking it off in room. The Emperor Claudius, the Roman Emperor Claudius, had such a terrible problem of grave robbing that he made it a capital crime. If you robbed a grave and they caught you, you would be killed. Their laws are very simple. It wasn't a big appeal process, because after you're dead, you can appeal it, but it isn't going to do you any good. And so Emperor Claudius says if you... If you steal a body, if you steal property, if you desecrate, you will be killed. It's a capital crime. And so, can you imagine all the things that Thomas was hearing that swirling around Jesus' death, the body's missing, what's going on? And he had to be confused. It had to be a time of misinformation. Fake news was running him up, the city of Jerusalem. <coughs> Verse 29, and Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Ooh, oh, yeah. No, this is huge. This is, that verse right there, verse 29, that is a transitional verse. You should maybe write transition in your Bible. Because all of a sudden, Jesus said, you see me, you hear me, you touch me, and that time has now passed, and now I need you to believe my words. Today, you and I hold the Word of God. We hold it in our hands. And when we hold the Word of God in our hands, we have a choice. You can believe, or you can be a skeptic. Thomas Jefferson. This is a true story. Thomas Jefferson didn't buy everything in the Bible. And so he took scissors and he cut out everything he didn't believe. And he taped together, you know. He put it, it's actually in the Smithsonian. It actually exists today. The Bible, that he would find things he was comfortable with that he bought, and he would leave it in, and whatever he didn't believe, whatever he didn't accept, he would cut out. That made it very clear where his heart was. My question is, where is my heart when I open the Word of God? Where is my heart when I need to hear from God? Where do I go when my heart is breaking? Where do I go in my grief? 
Where do I go when I'm struggling with wisdom? Where do I go when the circumstances and the doctor's reports? And where do I go when things are not giving me the answers that I want? And here's my challenge. Are you trusting the promises of God? If you don't open the Word of God, you will never know the promises of God. And the promises of God reflect the person who God is. The promises of God are sure and fast because of the person that's making the promises. So the key to this whole thing is, we, you and I need to get to know personally who God is. On your handout, front page at the very bottom, I give you one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Because this flows so well with this passage. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. That's Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see. Thomas was saying, I want to personally experience Jesus. I, am not, I don't want to experience what Randy experienced with Him. I want to have my own personal experience with Jesus. And when it happens to me, then I will believe. When it happens to me, then I'll buy into it. I don't want to experience what somebody else experienced. When it comes to choosing who God is, my challenge for you, <clears throat> will you meet God in prayer? Will you meet God in the darkness? Will you meet God, by the way, in the darkness, in the storms of life, when you seem to have the fewest number of answers, that is when God has promised to draw the closest to you. And I want you to think of faith as a muscle. When you think of faith as a muscle, and the Bible teaches us clearly that faith comes from hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Why? Because we get to know God. We learn we can trust Him because of what He tells us. We expose, He reveals Himself to us. But I want you to think about faith as a muscle. If you exercise a muscle, it grows and your muscle develops, right? If you do not exercise your faith, it will atrophy. I do not want my faith to atrophy because I'm living on what I can see, what I can understand. I actually had a, a friend this week tell me, well, and she claimed it was a, a surgeon that told her this. She claims that the surgeon had told her, well, your problem is you're relying on faith and I'm relying on science. Fascinating. Yeah. She was wanting an answer to a health problem, and he was, and she's like, well, what about, and he's like, well, you're talking about God, and I'm talking about science, and he says, the two cannot coexist, he, what she, and, and I, she was struggling, which is why she came to me, she said, so what do I believe? <coughs> I told her, I said, well, here's the deal, I said, you can believe the surgeon, because in next month's magazine that the surgeons have published, it's going to have a whole other theory on whatever it is that he's talking about. And what he believes is going to be shifting and changing. Why? Because what science is doing, what medicine is doing, they are practicing and they're learning and they're developing. And, and what happens? It's changing at all times. But I said, God will make promises that are good for eternity. So I said, <coughs> I told her, I says, you open the Word of God, you listen. And I, I know you know this, but I find it worth repeating what is a word a word is an expression of a thought I have a thought and I express it and as I express it what all of a sudden we have the Word of God God expressing his thoughts if I want to know the very thoughts of God then I need to read the Word of God why because as I read the Word of God I can begin to understand what God thinks and how God thinks about what whatever is going on in my life and these are terribly important principles that, uh, that believers need to ingrain in our hearts. We need to, like Thomas, have a personal experience with Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you one more thought on this. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In every book in the Gospels, when someone has an encounter with Jesus, they are challenged and forced to make a decision. Jesus challenged people to change their hearts, to change their minds. Every time Jesus met with someone, he drove to the heart of the matter. He did not make it easy for them. He dealt in truth, he dealt in promises, and he dealt with people's hearts and minds. So when you open the Word of God, the Spirit of God will knock on your heart, will knock on your mind, 
And like Thomas, who had eight days of having the Spirit of God deal with him, you and I have that same opportunity to have the Spirit of God deal in our hearts.